Good morning and welcome to the St Philip's Insolvency Conference. Thank you for joining us. It's fabulous that so many of you have logged on. Uh, we've got a fabulous lineup of talks this week. Today, Iqbal Mohammed and Mark Brown will speak about cross-border issues and Brexit. Tomorrow, Chris Buckingham and I will speak about property interests in insolvency law. Then on Wednesday, Ali Tabari and Kirsty White will consider fraud in 2022, the insolvency angle. There's no doubt plenty to talk about there. On Thursday, Avtar Kanguri and Natalie Kearney will speak about economic duress, including, of course, the recent Pakistan International Airlines and Times travel case, and also about personal guarantees. Then, to round off the week, James Morgan will consider the current case law on misfeasance, and Raghav Trivedi and Amanpreet Kaur will bring you a general case law update. If you've got any questions uh, as during this talk, during any of the talks, I'd encourage you to send them in in the Q&A or the comment section. We want to make these as interactive as possible. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so uh, here's our uh, agenda for today. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about um, cross-border issues that do not involve uh, issues of Brexit. Uh, so we're going to look at recognition of foreign proceedings at common law. Uh, then we'll look at uh, recognition under the cross-border insolvency regulations. Uh, and then finally, a case uh, that concerns uh, Section 236 of the Insolvency Act uh, in a cross-border context, uh, and importantly, considered uh, the issue of witness immunity. Uh, and then after I've spoken, Iqbal Mohammed will talk to you about Brexit-related cross-border issues, uh, the transition period, uh, and then the after uh, the transition period has ended. So in order to talk to you about updates on uh, cross-border insolvency, I'm going to uh, talk to you about uh, a number of cases. And I'm going to start by talking about Kariva against uh, Benjamin a case this year in the Court of Appeal. The uh, uh, question before the Appeal Court was uh, whether the judge was right to recognise a Russian bankruptcy. That's the first question. And secondly, whether the judge was right to decline assistance to a Russian receiver in respect of property uh, in London. The bankrupt that we were concerned with in this case was Mr. Bejimov. Uh, he had lived in Russia, but by the time he was declared bankrupt in uh, the Russian court, uh, he no longer lived in Russia, uh, but he had moved uh, to England. Uh, considering recognition uh, and assistance, the Court of Appeal started uh, by reviewing the case of Rubin against Eurofinance. Uh, and this is uh, one of the key cases, Rubin, and the second is RE-HIH. Uh, the considered recognition of foreign insolvency proceedings uh, in uh, England and Wales. And in Rubin, the Supreme Court uh, had summarised that there are four ways of recognising foreign insolvency proceedings in this jurisdiction. The first is the EC regulation and recognising proceedings uh, through that route. Uh, and the Court of Appeal noted uh, that following uh, Brexit, the EC regulation would no longer be available uh, where main proceedings are opened uh, after exit day. Uh, more on that to follow with Iqbal. The second way of recognising foreign insolvency proceedings is under Section 46 uh, of the Insolvency Act 1986, uh, whereby a foreign court can ask for the assistance in insolvency proceedings of uh, the court here. But that section only applies to relevant countries and they're defined in section 4611 of the Insolvency Act. And they're essentially countries that share a common law tradition uh, with England and Wales. Uh, it doesn't include Russia, uh, so didn't apply to the case of Mr. Bejimov. The third method of recognition is under the cross-border insolvency re uh, regulations. Uh, that concerns the UNCTRL uh, model law. And in order for proceedings to be recognised under UNCTRL, uh, there must be foreign main proceedings 
or foreign non-main proceedings. Uh, foreign main proceedings are where foreign proceedings have been opened, uh, where the debtor has their centre of main interests. Foreign non-main proceedings are insolvency proceedings opened in a country where the debtor does not have their centre of main interests, but the debtor does have an establishment. Mr. Bejimov had, by the time of the uh, bankruptcy, uh, moved out of Russia uh, to England. So uh, it couldn't be said that the Russian bankruptcy proceedings were foreign main proceedings because his centre of main interests were, were not in Russia. Uh, nor could they be said to be foreign non-main proceedings because Mr. Bejimov did not have an establishment in Russia. So uh, in the case of Mr. Bejimov, we couldn't use the EC regulation, couldn't use section 426, we couldn't use the cross-border insolvency regulations. Uh, and that leaves uh, recognition at common law. Uh, recognition had, at common law had been considered, as I say, in re-HIH uh, and in uh, Rubin. And uh, the courts have sought to develop uh, a, a model called modified universalism. Uh, and what that means is that the court should in general try at common law uh, to ensure that bankruptcy proceedings uh, are governed by one universal insolvency procedure and that the common law should seek to assist the realization and distribution of a debtor's assets in accordance with that single insolvency procedure. In relation to the recognition appeal, uh, the bankruptcy was brought on the basis of a, a guarantee. And Mr. Bejimov had uh, put in written evidence denying that he had signed uh, the relevant guarantee and therefore denying the appropriateness of the bankruptcy procedure. And the judge at first instance had dismissed that evidence uh, and on the basis of the bankruptcy order appearing to be good and proper, uh, had recognized uh, the Russian bankruptcy proceedings. Uh, the Court of Appeal uh, held that Mr. Bejimov's case, that he'd not signed the relevant guarantee, should not have been discounted when his written evidence uh, said that he'd not signed it. Uh, and the Court of Appeal therefore held that oral evidence from Mr. Bejimov uh, was required uh, before any court could uh, determine what he was saying in his witness evidence, and it couldn't be discounted uh, purely on the basis uh, of his uh, witness statement. So the judge, the Court of Appeal held, were wrong uh, to, to was wrong to recognise uh, the uh, Russian bankruptcy proceedings, uh, but that wasn't an end to the recognition process. Uh, the recognition application would need to be remitted to the High Court for directions uh, for oral evidence to be given. Uh, and a determination. What's more interesting for our purposes is the second part of the appeal, uh, which was whether the judge was right to dismiss uh, an application uh, for uh, a recognition of a receiver over property in London. In relation to that, uh, we were concerned with the immovables rule, uh, which is a rule of long standing that uh, a foreign court has no jurisdiction over land in England. So where the matter concerns real property, uh, only a court in England and Wales uh, can make orders over that real property. Uh, and uh, 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 therefore uh, the court should not recognize an order of the Russian bankruptcy uh, appointing a receiver over property in London. So the Court of Appeal considered how the modified universalism approach developed in HIH uh, and in Rubin uh, should interact with the immovables rule. The modified universalism principle suggesting that the Russian bankruptcy should be recognized uh, and, dealt, and the bankruptcy dealt with in accordance uh, with that single insolvency process, but the immovables rule saying that no court should have any say over property uh, here in England. Uh, the Court of Appeal decided in a split decision two to one uh, that the immovables rule uh, should trump the modified universalist rule. 
uh, the majority uh, decided that uh, to have jurisdiction over immovable property here in England and Wales, uh, there would need to be bankruptcy proceedings here. The Court of Appeal noted that it wasn't uh, sure whether any bankruptcy proceedings could be brought in this jurisdiction against Mr. Begemov. But nonetheless, that was the route by which uh, the immovables property, uh, the immovables rule could be complied with. A bankruptcy order here, and so the English court exercising jurisdiction uh, over property here. The minority in the Court of Appeal disagreed, uh, finding that the modified universalism process uh, was not in conflict with the immovables rule. That by recognizing the uh, foreign bankruptcy process, uh, the English court was uh, exercising jurisdiction over the property. And by that recognition uh, was exercising its jurisdiction uh, over uh, the uh, property here in England. So with a split decision of two to one, it seems to me likely uh, that, the court, that the case will go to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court can determine uh, quite how the modified universalism approach uh, that has been a development of the highest court uh, can interact uh, with the immovables rule. So I expect that we will see further development of the common law recognition uh, of foreign uh, insolvency proceedings in this jurisdiction. Uh, and that may become more important at a time when uh, 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 we are looking at post-Brexit. Uh, so certainly a development to look out for. Uh, I'll come on to look at three cases uh, that look at recognition of uh, foreign proceedings uh, under the cross-border insolvency regulation. So these recognition app uh, applications under the cross-border insolvency regulations continue uh, to be uh, common. Uh, these three recent cases uh, discuss issues of a debtor's center of main interests, uh, companies that have been dissolved, uh, and companies that are in fact solvent. Uh, the first of them on the left hand side of your screen uh, is Ri Li Shu Chung. Uh, Li Shu Chung uh, was a debtor, the subject of Hong Kong bankruptcy proceedings. Uh, and the application was to recognize those Hong Kong proceedings uh, here in this jurisdiction under the CBIR. Uh, the court noted that recognition depends on there being, as I said, foreign main or foreign non-main proceedings. And in order to determine uh, whether there are foreign main or foreign non-main proceedings, uh, you'll need to determine where the debtor has their center of main interests uh, or uh, where they have an establishment. The court confirmed that the center of main interest tests uh, is determined in the same way as under the EC regulation. Uh, the uncontrolled model law uh, doesn't have a definition of centre of main interests, but there is a long body of case law developed under the EC regulation in relation uh, to Comey, uh, and that should be treated uh, in the same way uh, under uh, the uncontrolled model law. Uh, what that case law says about determining a debtor's centre of main interests is that what's important uh, is what is apparent to creditors. What would a creditor looking uh, at this debtor think of that person's center of main interest? Here, the debtor had moved from Hong Kong uh, to England. He had his residence uh, in England and therefore argued that his center of main interest was in England uh, and not in Hong Kong. The court examined all of the evidence and paid particular weight, placed particular weight on what would have been apparent uh, to creditors and found that notwithstanding that the debtor's residence was in England, his centre of main interests remains in Hong Kong. And the result was uh, therefore that the Hong Kong proceedings were foreign main proceedings that could be recognised under uncontrol. The importance of this case is to show that de uh, determining Comey will always be fact specific. Uh, it will usually require a full examination 
of uh, the debtor's communication with creditors uh, and uh, the debtor's situation to examine and determine what creditors would uh, uh, see as being the debtor's centre of main interests. The second of these three cases is Reed Deep Black Drilling LLP. Uh, as you might imagine from the name, uh, this was a mining uh, partnership. Uh, Deep Black Drilling LLP was a company or an LLP uh, registered in England and Wales, but had its operations in Brazil. It was subject to foreign main proceedings uh, in Brazil. But six months prior to the bankruptcy, the LLP was dissolved in England and Wales. The court found that that didn't prevent recognition of the foreign uh, main proceedings, uh, even though the LLP had ceased to exist uh, here in England and Wales. Uh, and that had happened because there had been a prior restructuring process when the LLP was still on the company's register, but by the time that restructuring process was converted uh, into a, a full-blown insolvency process, uh, the LLP had been dissolved. Uh, so the court held that doesn't prevent recognition, uh, but uh, that the assistance to be given uh, by way of recognition should be limited to giving permission to the foreign representatives to apply to restore the LLP to the register. Otherwise, that action might be restrained by the general stay uh, on proceedings that occurs once foreign main proceedings uh, are recognised. And one would expect that to be the first step to be taken uh, by uh, the foreign uh, insolvency practitioners. Uh, as the court noted, uh, upon the dissolution, all of the LLP's assets uh, would have vested in the Crown as Bonavacantia. Uh, and so the first thing they would need to do is restore the LLP to the register. But once that's done, uh, it would appear that it's no different uh, to any other recognition. Uh, the third case involving the CBIR uh, is Resturgeon Central Asia Balance Fund Limited. Uh, this was a Bermuda liquidation, and the application was to recognize that liquidation as foreign main proceedings. It wasn't disputed that the centre of main interests was indeed uh, in Bermuda. However, the difference here was that this company was solvent. Uh, it was in liquidation uh, as a solvent company. Uh, and the court noted that this was the first application of this kind uh, where the liquidation of the solvent company had sought uh, recognition. Uh, the court held that in order to be recognised under the CBIR, that the proceedings must relate to the resolution of insolvency or financial distress. As a result, the application for recognition was refused. Uh, and that makes clear that the purpose of the CBIR uh, and the uncontrolled model law is to deal with companies in distress uh, rather than uh, any form of international MVL. So the last case that I'm going to talk about uh, before I hand you over to Iqbal is uh, RE MBI International uh, and Partners. Uh, this case involved a BVI company and the liquidators applied for recognition here uh, as foreign main proceedings under the CBIR. The liquidators applied for and obtained an order for an examination under Section 236 of the Insolvency Act 1986. That examination that took place and the liquidators then brought an action in England and Wales against the directors of the company for breach of duty, breach of trust, the usual source of misfeasance actions uh, against directors. During the trial, however, uh, it became clear once the director was giving evidence uh, the statements that had been made during the Section 236 examination, importantly as to the ownership of some shares, uh, were false. So the liquidators applied to amend their claim 
uh, to include a claim that the directors had breached their duty by giving false information during the Section 236 examination. That uh, amendment application uh, was uh, ultimately refused. The judge at first instance had allowed the amendment, but the Court of Appeal overturned that decision. The basis of opposing the application for amendment uh, was that when a, a, a person is subject to an examination under Section 236, they have the benefit of witness immunity or immunity from suit. The Court of Appeal held that that was right, uh, that 236 examinations uh, are part of a wider judicial process. Therefore, the examinee is entitled to immunity from suit in relation to statements made during the examination. Uh, and that applies whether the statements are made orally or in writing. So what's said uh, during uh, the Section 236 examination uh, cannot form a basis by itself uh, of a cause, in, a cause of action. It may, however, be subject to the oversight of the court, uh, for example, by way uh, of uh, contempt. But it can't form the basis uh, of, a, of a cause of action uh, by itself, which is what the liquidators uh, had sought to do here by bringing a claim uh, by alleging breach of duty in giving that false information. Now that applies uh, both domestically and in the cross-border uh, context. The court also held uh, that the fact that this was a BVI company uh, didn't make any difference to the nature of the 236 examination as a judicial process. Uh, and so importantly for us, that means not only uh, does this immunity apply uh, where there's a cross-border aspect, uh, but indeed in any uh, 236 examination. Well, those are the cases that I wanted to talk to you about in relation to cross-border insolvency. If you have any questions on a cross-border issue, uh, please do pop it in the q and I'd be happy to talk about it. Uh, meanwhile, however, I'll hand you over to Iqbal. Thank you, Mark. Right. Uh, the other thing that's been going on for two years is um, Brexit. We may have missed that with all of our mask wearing and um, lateral flow testing. Uh, it's been two years since the UK left the European Union, uh, as at um, 11 o'clock uh, at night on the 31st of January. How has the legislative landscape changed for insolvency practitioners since Brexit? Um, there are three periods that we're going to talk about. The first is up to exit day. Uh, which was on the 31st of January 2020. The transitional period which ended at uh, 2300 on the 31st of December 2020 and then the post-transitional arrangements. During the transitional period, uh, in essence, EU legislation was directly applicable in the UK uh, and the UK was treated as if it was still a member of the EU, even though of course it wasn't. Um, and the Insolvency Regulation of 2000 and the more widely known Recast Insolvency Regulation will con still continue to apply. And in essence, uh, the change from uh, the transitional arrangements to post-transitional arrangements is to what extent the Recast Insolvency Regulation applies. The, the legislative scheme uh, that was adopted by Parliament involved, in essence, two uh, Acts of Parliament. The first was the European Union Withdrawal Act of 2018, which I'll try my very best to call the Withdrawal Act. Uh, and how that worked was that it took a snapshot of the EU law that already applied as of the 31st of December 2020 and incorporated that into English law before it was then amended by English law um, to adjust and reflect the new realities of uh, Brexit uh, in the United Kingdom. The assumption was that there would not be a deal and uh, all of the uh, no-deal provisions would kick in as of exit day. We, know, we now know that there was indeed a deal made with the EU, and as a result, the Withdrawal Agreement Act was passed and given effect to, uh, giving effect to the Withdrawal Agreement, and as a result, what that did was it moved the effective dates of the statutory instruments made under the Withdrawal Act 
to the end of the transition period as opposed to the exit day. Um, we're really concerned with one um, statutory instrument, uh, that is the Insolvency Amendment EU Exit reg Regulations. Um, I'll call them the Exit Regulations for short. And in essence, what they do uh, is twofold. During the transition period, they're the legal basis for ensuring that the recast insolvency regulations apply, uh, even though the uh, UK is no longer a member of the European Union. And then following uh, transition, uh, the, following the transition period ending, um, they then um, incorporate into EU law, uh, into UK law, forgive me, a modified version of the recast regulation, the recast insolvency regulation. Um, So, talking about the transition period, the transition period is fairly straightforward. The headline points are here that um, everything is as it was before. Uh, the legal basis for it is slightly different, but the, um, the recast regulation applies to, any, uh, to, to all proceedings um, that, were, that were presented or affected in the transition period, and indeed right up to the 23rd, right up to the 2300 of the 31st of December 2020. Um, in essence, in essence, um, the Insolvency Regulation 2000 continued to apply, the Recast Insolvency Regulation continues to apply, and so long as proceedings were open before the 31st of December at, uh, 2300, as I just said, um, the, in essence, it's just the same as the UK being a member of the European Union. The jurisdiction of the UK courts is the same, and the rulings of the uh, ECJ and all of the EU directives, howsoever they are given effect to in the United Kingdom, continue to apply. So headline point, nothing changes uh, in the transition period. Uh, the legal basis of that is, uh, is of some interest, uh, because you may have to explain, for example, in a skeleton argument or in a brief, why exactly that is the case. The first uh, port of call is the EU Withdrawal Act. As I've said, what that did is that that legislated for all of the no-deal provisions, and that's the starting point. Critically, under this Act, under Section 8, uh, Parliament uh, empowered the Secretary of State, to, or all of the Secretary of States, to pass subordinate legislation to give effect, to, to remedy any lacunas or any deficiencies there might be uh, by the snapshot approach. Following the, uh, the deal with the European Union, the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Act 2020 was uh, passed by Parliament and that deferred the effective date of the exit regulations and that also gives effect to the withdrawal agreement and as a result that then modified the effective period of the exit regulations uh, to uh, the end of the transition period. So that's the legislative framework of how, uh, how um, these changes come into effect. We've got the Withdrawal Act, we've got then uh, the statutory instruments made thereunder and then we've got the modification of the effective date of those statutory instruments by the Withdrawal Agreement Act. Post-transition. We are now concerned with um, any proceedings that were issued after 2300 on the 31st of December 2020. I have to try and remember 2300 because 11 o'clock obviously it could be morning or evening. But 2300 after the 31st of December 2020. Now we face the autumnal uplands of being an interdependent country and we are no longer a member of the EU. Um, first of all, uh, what that means is that the recast insolvency regulation does not have effect in the United Kingdom. We're not on, we, are, we are no longer a member state and therefore our um, uh, determinations, for example, with regards to COMI or as Mark says, COMI. Uh, do not uh, are not automatically recognised by the European Union. Um, indeed, we're not required to give effect to or recognise automatically uh, a determination as to COMI by a member state of the European Union. Importantly, then, for us as a non-member state, the national law of the member state in question, be it Poland or France or Germany, becomes relevant because whether or not our determinations as to call me or whether or not our main proceedings would be recognised in another member state is really a matter of the substance of the domestic law of the member state in question, for example France or Poland or whatever the member state. 
With regards to the exit regulations and on this point, they apply, uh, and I'm going to be concerned with their effect following the transition period. Um, first of all, they don't apply to uh, what I've referred to as accepted proceedings. Um, these are proceedings where the main proceedings were opened during the transition period. So we're all fine if you opened uh, the main proceedings during the transition period or before that. We are concerned with what happens after the transition period concluded. In essence, what the exit regulations do is they import the recast and solvency regulation with some modifications. And uh, they're, they're referred to in, in many different ways, but the statutory instrument refers to it as, as modified, the recast and solvency regulation as modified by UK domestic law. Um, I can reduce this, uh, the, the, the substance of the regulations to two points. Firstly, in addition to the other grounds of recognition, uh, which Mark talked about uh, in his uh, uh, seminar, they create a, a new, well, uh, two new grounds for recognition of main, uh, for, sorry, forgive me, two new grounds for establishing uh, English jurisdiction over insolvency proceedings. The first is that it allows the debtor to be placed into UK insolvency, where the commie is in uh, the UK. These are called commie proceedings. Secondly, it allows uh, a, a debtor to be placed into UK insolvency where the commie is in the EU and there is an establishment in the UK, so-called establishment proceedings. So these are the two new bases uh, to, find, um, to found UK jurisdiction uh, over insolvency. Um, given that the recast insolvency regulation no longer applies, the UK is no longer a member state, uh, there are significant ramifications in terms of recognition and coordination, which was the very purpose of that uh, regulation. Um, this results in an uneven uh, playing field when it comes to recognition of cross-border insolvency uh, with regards to the UK and the EU member states. With regards to the EU, um, an insolvency practitioner uh, who has opened main proceedings in a European Union, Union member state, they can apply for recognition in the UK under the cross-border insolvency regulations. So there is a route to establishing recognition uh, under regulations passed um, in and effective in the UK. With regards to the UK uh, seeking recognition in the EU, it's slightly more difficult. So if there was a, an insolvency practitioner appointed under main proceedings in the United Kingdom and they sought to be recognised, for example, in France or in Greece or in Germany, it would very much depend on that member state's national law and there may or may not be an easy way of being recognised in that member state. I've, uh, for my sins, had a look at um, a very interesting uh, paper prepared for practical law on the different um, arrangements in domestic law in all of the member states. Uh, and they are quite complicated and it's not quite so straightforward to, to summarise or to divine any points of principle between them. Uh, and it would be very likely that um, a local law firm would have to be appointed that specialises in the insolvency law of that particular member state. In addition to that, um, the UNSER trial model law also becomes quite relevant and quite important. Uh, for example, the UK has adopted into domestic law, the UNSA trial model law, and it would be relevant, or would certainly become more relevant, whether other member states have, but it's not particularly popular in the EU. Of course, the EU has the recast insolvency regulation, so it doesn't particularly need to worry about UNSA trial. But that may be something that uh, practitioners are required to familiar, familiarise themselves uh, more with to obtain easier recognition in the EU. So, to summarise, Everything is fine up until the end of the transition period at 2300 hours um, on the 31st of uh, December 2020. So long as main proceedings were open before that period, uh, the uh, recast insolvency regulation applies, the insolvency recognition applies, and it was all the same as before. However, 
after the uh, transition period comes to an end, uh, so 2301 on the th 31st of December 2020, um, the exit regulations apply, which adopt the recast and sourcing regulation with significant modifications into UK law. The modifications, in effect, create only two, route, two, two new routes to establish UK jurisdiction. The first is that if there is a commie in the UK, uh, commie proceedings can be opened as main proceedings in the UK. And it, or, secondly, if the commie is in the EU and there is an establishment in the UK, so-called establishment proceedings can be opened in the UK as main proceedings. As I've said, recognition of these proceedings as main proceedings by the EU member state or affected member states would be a question of their domestic law and there is currently no, uh, there is no uh, EU-wide uh, re regime of recognising UK proceedings as main proceedings in the UK. Some would say that is a natural consequence of Brexit, that was the whole point, but others, others would say that um, perhaps more work has to be done to create uh, parity between UK practitioners seeking recognition in the EU and EU, rec EU practitioners seeking recognition in the UK who have a slightly uh, more certain way of doing so, given that um, we have already established regulations to allow them to do that.